Our next speaker is Mike Turner from Betelel Academy of Arts and Design. He's going to be talking about cultural landscapes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for, um, uh, for the invitation of being here. Uh, James had asked how many people from the food industry are present, and perhaps I should ask how many architects are present in this room. Uh, I'm pleased that I'm speaking after Ram because he's put a challenge of creativity, um, and in fact that it's all a matter of culture, and perhaps it's not just simply whether we're looking at tradition or intensification, but how in fact we can merge some of these issues. So I'm going to be speaking about um, uh, the cultural landscape, so it's looking very much at a particular aspect of uh, UNESCO and uh, exactly how it uh, evolved. Um, the actual history of the discussion of a, a cultural landscape started with the geographers at the beginning of the 20th century, and it was Carl Sauer who actually put the whole issue onto the map with the works of man expressing themselves in the cultural landscape. And they see that there's a succession of these landscapes with a succession of cultures. Now, the landscape changes through technology, through a lot of other things as well. So uh, he also actually looked at it and determined that the cultural landscape is fashioned from a natural landscape by a cultural group. Culture is the agent, natural area is the medium, and cultural landscape is the result. So I'm going to go fast forward and actually look into uh, 1972, which was the Convention for the Protection of World Cultural and Natural Heritage. And it essentially was between the people dealing with culture and the people dealing with uh, na nature. And it was only uh, the evolution of looking at mixed sites that the concept of cultural landscape took place with the adoption of the categories of, in 1992. So we can see again, this was within the convention of UNESCO, that it combined works of nature and man. Uh, that would have to be changed now and are illustrative of the evolution of human society and settlement over time. And this became then a critical aspect, and it was like really the cultural landscapes became uh, almost like a fire in a, in a, in a wheat field, in as much as that we now have uh, something like 88 cultural landscapes being, de uh, being designated within, uh, within the UNESCO Convention. Now, what happened is that they tried to evolve then different sorts of culture, uh, landscapes. The first one was that which was developed uh, um, intentionally uh, by design. So one would often look at uh, the gardens of Versailles, perhaps would be see a Kew Gardens might also be a particular cultural landscape. I'm going to put those to the side. It's the second group which is very interesting to us, and that's those of the evolving uh, landscapes, organically evolving landscapes is the first part, and those of the fossil, those ones which have no longer exist. And in fact, the uh, the incense route in the Negev is in fact a cultural landscape which is then determined as a fossil landscape. Uh, the third one is that of associative landscapes which has also got a certain importance uh, less relevant to what we'll talk about now. Uh, I think that we're all speaking about systems and the importance about integrative approach about how we actually manage uh, a lot of our activities. Uh, and even within UNESCO, it is very, very highly, highly uh, focused into particular aspects. And uh, one of the things which I'm working with in UNESCO is to try and get a more integrative approach between culture and nature. So we have the cultural landscapes. We have the Man and Biosphere program. Tamar Diana, I think she left, but she was, um, uh, was in, involved in the Man and Biosphere program here in Israel. We have protected areas. And then we also have intangible her heritage. And it is merging these issues which is critical in actually managing our lives, managing our environment. And it's not just simply saying, well, we've got culture, we've got then uh, nature, but we have to use all these mechanisms to put, uh, put, to put things uh, together. So we then look at the word which is the buzzword of sustainability. Uh, we have the Sustainable Development Goals. Israel was very, very uh, crit um, central in 
the drafting a group uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals, and I hope this will be reflected in a greater commitment than there was for the Millennium Development Goals. But we tend to sort of look then at uh, particular goals. So we were looked at, I forget which goal looked at the food uh, just before. Um, the architects look at goal 11, which makes our cities sustainable, resilient, and safe. Um, and some, something else, I think. But anyway, but, and I say, no, no, no. We should be looking at uh, food, and we should be looking at governance, and we should be looking at everything else. And we should then prevent the situation of the goals becoming then focused on particular aspects. And this is going to be very problematic because what is happening that we're, we're trying to identify uh, parameters and indicators, and the indicators are not uh, uh, interdisciplinary. And it was Max Weber in his uh, seminal book of the city that speaks about the importance of what a, a person which was called the urbanite. The urbanite was really, which he wanted to look at then, legitimately characterized by the fact that a kleros, or he or calls it also the chelek, which he called his own, was the parcel of lamb which fed him the full urbanite of antiquity was a semi-peasant. So I believe that the concept of sustainability is not between generations, and anyway, what do we mean by a generation anyway? But uh, the idea it is the sustainability between place. In other words, what we should be looking at is in fact how one space could in fact sustain the other rather in place, in, in topos and not in chronos, not only in chronos. So this is very, very critical, and when we spoke about then the cost of food, and we spoke about also heard about the issues of energy, and in fact, what the energy is cheap, which makes the fact that uh, food is imported. So when in fact then the energy is, has a realistic value, then it becomes more balanced towards local food, local activities, and this is where the balance is going to take place. So the concept, therefore, of a sustainable city is, always has its ideal within, uh, within, uh, within Max Weber, and it is debated now within many other aspects, especially within urban, urban biospheres. So what we really have, we've got water, we have then wine, the olives, rice, wheat, sheep, and then we have the art of the ceremony of bread making and of weaving. And these are crafts which might be traditional, but they can be intensified, and they are essential basis for exactly how to be really sustainable. So uh, over the years, especially after Agenda 21, there became an idea that there should be a fourth pillar uh, amongst the three pillars of uh, economics, uh, social, and environmental to create sustainable development. I'm com completely against this. I don't, first of all, four pillars as an engineering thing is a very, very unstable. We should have three pillars that's far stronger. And secondly, that I believe culture is a brace to the pillars. So therefore, this is the way which we can see it. In other words, the solution to solving India, I would tell to Ram, in fact, is really is a much more of a cultural meaning than rather than economic. And that was not in the, in the list of, of, of factors. So culture of being abraced of the three pillars of sustainability and the culture of achieving resilience involves continuous process of self-adaptation. And what we're now taking on in UNESCO is the fact that it is culture as an enabler for sustainable development. Not culture vis-a-vis -vis development, but that is the enabler of sustainable development, not speculative development, that won't go. But sustainable development and culture now become an entwinable uh, function. So I'd like to come close to home, and that's looking at the Mediterranean. And the most important book of the Mediterranean is, uh, is uh, Bordel, uh, written while he was a prisoner of war in the Second World War after being in the um, French uh, army. And he wrote this amazing book focusing on the 50 years of the second part of the 16th century of Philip II. And uh, looking at Mediterranean, uh, understanding it through the actual space of the olive, the space of the vine, and the northern space of the palm, of the, uh, of the oil. Uh, and so we're looking then at the structure, and he also balances it to what was the space of the Roman Empire. But it's looking about how empires change and understanding very much what we heard before about the Mediterranean uh, diet. Again, looking at the Mediterranean, we can see the palm grows all the way from the Indus to the Atlantic. I think, therefore, the issue of Islam essentially is a matter of diet. I would like also to look, therefore, as the issue, therefore, of, of the Jordan Rift Valley. 
and this is something work which I did uh, uh, with, um, uh, with Echo Peace many, many years ago, looking at the Jordan Rift Valley, but you can see very, very, I, you can see exactly how the, the Jordan, this is, I took this from, the, from uh, Belvoir, but you can see exactly how the, the settlements hit the area of the area of water. You can see the different two sections of agriculture. You can see the sheep at this part over here and then the area above. So uh, this is my drawing which tries to be able to understand exactly the geomorphology and the interconnection between uh, how the agriculture and the land uses which are taking place. I'd just like to share with you some of the cultural landscapes around the world and then specifically just to, to wrap up with something from, from uh, Israel. So we, are, um, we should be looking at then, first of all, water. That was the most important thing. Water then is divided out by families. It's called hima in Arabic. In other words, exactly how, in fact, we divide it out. When we look at it um, in the iflaj, or we have in uh, our part of the world, it's called the kanat, and the way, in fact, it's almost horizontal, horizontal um, uh, water, water sources of wells. And uh, we can see, therefore, the inscription, which is looking at the importance of technology, sustainable use of water resources from the cultivation of the palms. The rice terraces of the Philippines is also an amazing story. And I was involved uh, with the, uh, it being put on the world heritage in danger. Of course, who wants to uh, work on the rice terraces? Economically not viable. Again, it comes to tradition, which is, cannot take place and needs a, a different sort of structure. The Philippines asked to put it on the world heritage in danger, uh, in spite of um, uh, the treks of the Israelis after the army going to the Philippines and wanting to be there. But nevertheless, uh, a, a very, very interesting economic program was done which dealt with intensification and tradition and has brought back uh, a, a lot of uh, added value within the rice, with the rice terraces in the Philippines. And we then see coffee. Again, uh, looking at, uh, put, you can see the the actual parts of the tangible and intangible manifestations. In other words, the understanding exactly how food and how this comes about in all areas. So the, we're looking at then the space, and we talk about watersheds. Well, in the 19th century, we talked about milk sheds. In other words, how far you could actually bring milk at a particular time, keep it without pasteurization, but keep the area. So you can begin to see exactly how uh, the whole concept of how much you can then support and create sustainability between place becomes very, very critical. Uh, the other part we start looking at is that of the vine. Tokai was the region for the cultural landscape. Uh, this, in fact, is uh, an area of, from Hungary which was generated by Jewish um, growers of the uh, vine because of, because of the of uh, the prohibition of uh, using uh, wine which might have been then used for sacramental purposes. So it is essentially a Jewish story, this, of the Tokai wine. Uh, but again, one can see exactly how it is being used and how it's coming back in use uh, with this idea of intensification. We can look then at Piedmont and again, other areas and look at then the understanding of the, uh, of the cultural landscape. The cultural landscape in, uh, in Israel is that of the incense route of Chalutza, Mamshit, Avdat, and Shifta. These are the four uh, desert, uh, desert uh, uh, cities. And then this is uh, agricultural systems response to hostile desert environment. Just to end and to look at the land of olives and vines, which was declared by Palestine at the, as a Batir, uh, and again, they have Hima. They have uh, eight days in the week. Each day, they have eight families. Each day, uh, a family gets an amount of water, allocation of water. Uh, and this is the way which it is, is the management of the, of the area. It is not sustainable, mainly because uh, this needs to be a joint uh, activity between, uh, bet together with Israel. And then this would, in fact, create then a, a sustainability of the land of olives and vines. Uh, in looking at this area, we made a calculation uh, in trying to save the terraces, which we have a big program, research program at B'Tsalel, 
which looks at 11.5 square kilometers, of which we measured 554 kilometers of terraces, something like 200 million stones, representing 3,000 years of civilization. And these small things are, are, are being changed, and they are a very, very important part of, uh, of the cultural landscape. And to really end is just to look then at the seven species uh, over the four seasons. And I think that therefore, if we just quote the text from uh, Deuteronomy, that uh, bringing you into the good land, the land of brooks of water, so we need the water, um, flowing forth in valleys and hills, we need the geology, and a land of wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, land of olive trees and honey, um, honey being the palm, uh, really sort of then puts this in full sustainability. It's sustainable because it takes the whole four seasons to actually balance itself and use the four biomes which we have here in Israel to be able to supply this. Thank you.